hear that? That's what an estimated 500 horsepower sounds like. What? X don't give it to you. How about that? That's a premium banging Olufsen sound system with 18 speakers and a Biosonic sound experience. And that, <laughs> that's our legacy. You ready to be a part of it? X don't give it to you. Unlock the energy of the all-electric ZDX Type S. Give up. Order now at Acura.com. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Time for a meatful meditation by Smithfield. We know a thing or two about meat. Close your eyes and visualize yourself prepping your favorite meaty meal like sizzling bacon, a flavor packed and pre marinated pork loin, or a juicy cut of ham. Now step closer to those high-quality meats and take a deep breath in and out. Go ahead and take a bite. Oh, wait, you can't? Then it's time to stop the meditation and put the real quality meats from Smithfield on your plate. Smithfield, for the love of um, meat. Welcome to Wardles on the Verge. This is Zach Spedden. My co-hosts Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens are both out this week. There is still plenty to discuss in Birdland, though, so I will be checking in with two episodes Later on this week, I will bring you a preview of the MLB draft. On this episode, we will discuss the Orioles' decision to demote Jackson Holiday to AAA Norfolk and take questions from listeners about all things Major League and Minor League with the Orioles as part of our latest mailbag. But first, as we like to do at the beginning of every episode, I want to welcome some new members of our Patreon community. Orioles 1019 has joined us at the $3 level, while Christopher Baldwin has signed up at the AA level. Welcome to both Orioles 1019 and Christopher Baldwin. As a reminder, you can sign up for our Patreon community for as little as $3 a month, and there are plenty of perks that we provide our patrons, including bonus daily recaps throughout the minor league season, monthly updates to our top 50 prospects list, exclusive channels in our Discord community, and much more. So head over to Patreon to learn more about that. And as a reminder, we are nearing our live show at Checker Spot Brewing, which is slated for Saturday, May 11th, beginning at 2 p.m. That will be just before the Orioles take on the Diamondbacks that afternoon. So if you have tickets to the game, stop by ahead of time and see us. If you don't have tickets to the game, stick around Checker Spot after the show, as we will have the game on as part of a viewing party. And the good news is that on this episode, I can announce our first guest, Friend of the show, Connor Newcomb, the host of Locked On Orioles, will be joining us. Hopefully next week we will be able to announce additional guests. Bob has put out plenty of feelers to see who can join us. So hopefully next week we'll have more announcements. But for now, we can confirm that Connor Newcomb will be joining us. We'll also take listener questions at some point during that episode. But stay tuned between now and May 11th for more details on that. Sucker Spot Brewing located a short distance from Candom Yards. You're not going to want to miss this event. We'll backtrack now and discuss the big news from the past week, which is that the Orioles announced on Friday that they had optioned Jackson Holiday to the minor leagues and the corresponding moves. They designated Petra David Benuelos for assignment to clear a 40-man roster spot for Ryan McKenna, who rejoins the team from Norfolk after being designated for assignment back at the end of spring training. Now, Holiday had clearly struggled at the major league level. Um, we talked about this last week, Bob, Nick, and myself. And it was apparent at that point that he would need to get going to stay in the major leagues. But at the same time, our expectations then were that he'd have a little bit more of a runway than the Orioles ultimately gave him. We thought, you know, maybe in the mid-May, if he was still struggling, that's when you would make the move. But the Orioles deciding to go ahead and make that decision now. Holiday went two for 34 during his first stint in the major leagues with a negative 51 WRC plus and struck out in 50% of his 36 plate appearances. Holiday's struggles do speak for themselves and really reflect the issues that he had at the major league level. Still, though, I think for a lot of Orioles fans, the question has been, why now? Why bring Holiday up and send him back to AAA after just a couple of weeks? 
Um, isn't it possible that the Orioles could have tried something before sending him down, whether that was moving him in the order, maybe just giving him a few days to sit out and reset. But Michael Elias, in explaining the decision on Friday, seemed to kind of get to the point where the Orioles feel like they need to get holiday now with sin repetitions. And I'm quoting here from an article by Danielle Allentuck over at the Baltimore Banner. He needs repetitions, Elias said. I think the bright side is he got very intense, very specific feedback from Major League Pitching. He's a brilliant talent, very sharp kid. I expect he's going to go implement those adjustments very quickly. We felt AAA and steady playing time in AAA was the place for that. And it's worth noting that with the A series that began over the weekend, the Orioles are now going to be seeing much more left-handed pitching, kind of going on closer to the cycle they were on at the beginning of the season, where they were seeing a lot of left-handers before Holiday came up at the beginning of a stretch where they were going to be facing far more right-handed pitchers. What I kind of wonder, though, as Holiday goes back to AAA, is what is he going to be able to do to get better? Because he has mastered AAA to this point, and I was diving into the numbers a little bit this morning in preparation for this show. And one of the things that you could quibble with with Holiday last year, especially at AAA, was that he was hitting the ball on the ground maybe more often than you would like to see, that he really needed to drive the ball in the air more, hit the ball hard. And so far at AAA, his ground ball rate is down quite a bit from where it was during his stint at the end of last season. So he's making that adjustment. Now, John Mioli wrote a very good piece at the banner recently, kind of diving into some of the challenges that Holiday was having at the major league level, and specifically that when you're making that jump from AAA to the major leagues, you're now going to be seeing pitchers who throw harder and are more accurate than the pitchers that you've seen at AAA. You compound that with the fact that Holiday is 20 years old and has just one full season under his belt. And I think this situation does become a little bit different. Um, there's been a lot of comparisons in the aftermath of the Orioles' decision to send Holiday down to Colton Kowser coming up last year, struggling, getting optioned, and ultimately resurfacing this spring and so far emerging as one of the Orioles' best hitters. Grayson Rodriguez getting optioned last year after his initial struggles in the major leagues, going back to Norfolk for a little while and then coming back to the Orioles over the summer and emerging as one of their best starters down the stretch run. For Holiday, I think that the key in going back to Norfolk is just going to be the at-bats. The Orioles felt like they couldn't give him regular playing time here, and they maybe didn't feel like there was a way to easily get him to the point where he needs to be offensively without regular playing time. Now, it's worth noting that the Orioles performed really well with Holiday struggling at the bottom of their order. Their lineup still performed really well, and he was giving them plenty of value on defense. So maybe there is an argument to be made that two more weeks with Jackson Holiday wouldn't have to prove anything. Give him a couple bit, couple more weeks and see what he's able to do. But what I think this comes down to is that the Orioles just didn't anticipate that there would be a lot of playing time for Holiday over the next few weeks. They're now going to send him down to Norfolk. And honestly, I don't know what the timeline is. We're going to get into this a little bit more in the mailbag segment. I don't know that there's a clear benchmark for when you're going to see him back up in the major leagues in terms of timing. I don't think that there's a date you can look at on the calendar or a certain number of plate appearances that he's going to have to log. And then you figure out, okay, he's coming back up. What I suspect is that it's going to be something similar to what we saw at the beginning of this year when we thought Holiday might be down in Norfolk for a couple of months and wouldn't come up after the first week or so of the season, which is a lot of at-bats against left-handed pitching and a lot of innings at second base. He's making the adjustments defensively at a very good pace, but offensively, there's still some work to do. Long term, this is just going to be a bump in the road. Holiday is going to be fine. He's going to be a very good player in this league for a long time. The Orioles are going to be fine. They're still winning games. They were winning games before without him. They were winning games with him while he was struggling. I expect they're going to continue to win while he's down in Norfolk. And that when we see him later this year, he's going to be given the opportunity to showcase what he can do for a team that is contending. But for now, 
he's going to have to go back down to Norfolk and work on some of the things that he struggled with in the major leagues, hitting breaking balls, hitting left-handed pitching. And there's not going to be a, you know, and that's something I will acknowledge that there's not going to be a way to easily recreate the major league experience in, in Norfolk because you just can't. But the Orioles are going to have to figure out a way for Holiday to get the most out of his time down in AAA so that when he comes back up to the major leagues, it's ultimately for good. Holiday's ETA for returning to Baltimore is a good segue into our mailbag segment. As we've got a couple of questions about that exact topic from Joe Adams and the Bird is the Word, who both want to know how long we should expect Jackson Holiday to stay in Norfolk before he is recalled by the Orioles. As I said earlier, I really don't think that there's a clear benchmark in terms of plate appearances, because if there was a minimum number of plate appearances, let's say 250 to 300 that the Orioles felt like Holiday needs at AAA before he comes up, they wouldn't have promoted him in early April. Um, His first call up to the major leagues probably wouldn't have come until at least the middle of May, maybe even early June. So Don't look at that number so much when trying to figure out when Holiday is going to come back because I just don't know that it matters a whole lot in this case. Now, with that said, to try to answer the question, given the information we have right now, I'll just go on speculation and say that Holiday is back in early July. It gives him a couple of months to reset down at Norfolk. It gives the Orioles time to assess how he is handling that move down both on and off the field. And then he comes back up at a point where they can start to look at their roster and really assess what they need at the trade deadline. And if they feel like bringing him up then gives them another left-handed bat or gives them an upgrade at second base, then they can focus on other areas of the roster. I would be surprised if Holiday is down in Norfolk for you know, a period of time that's so long that we're looking at him not coming up until September. But I also don't expect him back up in a couple of weeks. So I'll say for now that I think early July is when we should expect Holiday back up. We'll look now at a question of roster construction that has more immediate implications for the Orioles. Bobby Jones wants to know, how does the bullpen play out with everyone nearing their return at once? While the bird is a word asks, who's the odd man out of the rotation? Once Kyle Bradis returns, and it looks like Bradis and John Means are both close to returning to the major leagues, and how that's going to affect the rest of the roster is interesting. For starters, I think Johan Ramirez is probably going to be the odd man out in the bullpen. The Orioles brought him in really to fill in innings, and he has struggled to this point. I don't think that the Orioles saw him as a long-term solution. I think it was really a stopgap while they... He was a stopgap option while they waited for some of their other pitchers to get healthy and get back on the mound in the major leagues. At that point, maybe Albert Suarez goes to the bullpen, which clears one rotation spot. Now, as for the other spot, I think that that decision is going to be a little bit harder because Cole Irvin has now put together back-to-back very good starts. And then you have in your bullpen Mike Bauman, who has struggled to this point in the year but he is out of options. So you would have to put him through waivers to send him down to Norfolk. Now, I want to dive into Bauman a little bit because his struggles to this point in the season have been apparent. He's walking more batters than you would like to see. And what's been odd to me is that he's not throwing his fastball as much as he was last year, despite the fact the fastball velocity averaging 96 miles per hour, kind of in line with where it was last year. He's been throwing his curveball more often instead, and the results just haven't been good for him. So if you're looking at someone who could use a little bit of a reset down at AAA, it could be Bauman. Now, if the Orioles would decide, though, that they want to give Bauman a little bit more time, maybe until Tyler Wells comes back to see if he can get things right, then maybe the move becomes to option Keegan Aiken. I, admittedly, I think this is less likely, but Aiken does have options. With Means coming back, you possibly put Cole Urban in the bullpen, or you put Means in the bullpen, and you have your lefty who can give you innings. And then you wait to see if Bauman can get things set at the major league level 
before you decide whether or not to DFA him. That's admittedly a move that I think is less likely to happen, but something to keep an eye on. You know, Aiken has not been as effective in his last couple of outings, although his strikeout to walk numbers are still really good. So the Orioles may feel like in the short term, because they have Means and Irvin, they can let Aiken go down to AAA, give Bauman a chance to work things out at the major league level. Again, I don't know that that's necessarily what happens, but it's an alternate scenario to think about as you look at how the bullpen is going to be constructed. Go now to this question from Joe Adams, who wants to know, if Austin Hayes returns and either can't get back to form or gets injured again and is out for a while, who do you think the Orioles turn to as a long-term replacement? Any scenario where there's a long-term opening in the outfield should help Heston Kerstad or Kyle Stowers, because neither one of them has much left to prove at AAA. They just need to find an opening at the major league level for consistent at-bats. Now, with that said, if the Orioles are going to focus on getting a right-handed hitter in place, there's a couple of different ways they could go. One of them is to do what they're doing now, which is to put Ryan McKenna on the roster. And I know that that's going to upset some listeners because Ryan McKenna can sneeze at the wrong time and Orioles social media explodes. But I think the one thing we can agree on is that McKenna is a player that has specific skill set that makes him a good organizational piece, but he's not a long-term answer on the major league roster. So now you have to look at your other options. Reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest, but let me play devil's advocate here. Let's see. So, no, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> that's definitely not a problem. Uh, Reese's, you did it. You stumped this charming devil. Time for a meatful meditation by Smithfield. We know a thing or two about meat. Close your eyes and visualize yourself prepping your favorite meaty meal like sizzling bacon, a flavor packed and pre marinated pork loin, or a juicy cut of ham. Now step closer to those high-quality meats and take a deep breath in and out. Go ahead and take a bite. Oh, wait, you can't? Then it's time to stop the meditation and put the real quality meats from Smithfield on your plate. Smithfield, for the love of all meat. Life is a highway, and on it there will be many chicken sandwiches. But there's only one crispy. so go ahead and hit the turn signal if you know about this juicy gem of a detour. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. Maybe Kobe Mayo starts to get more reps in the outfield at Norfolk and you bring him up to the major leagues as a right-handed bat who could bounce between a couple of different positions, mainly right field and third base, perhaps with some first base mixed in. Or you look at the trade market. It wouldn't be hard um, closer to the deadline to find a fourth outfielder who can hit from the right side and give you a little bit of value, at least in terms of speed and defense. And while I don't have a specific player in mind right now. Generally speaking, I think that's something that's easy to come by. Looking at Hayes specifically, I do think that the Orioles are going to give him the opportunity to reset and get things right at the major league level. But at the same time, with the way Colton Kowser is performing right now, not to mention that I think Anthony Santander is close to heating up. I just have that feeling. It's going to be hard for Hayes to find regular events. That mention of Kobe Mayo is a good segue to this question from Ben E. He wants to know who's the next prospect to get promoted to the Orioles. And I'll focus solely on players who have yet to receive promotion to the major leagues. So that takes Kyle Stowers, Heston Kerstad, and Jackson Holiday out of the out of the discussion. For me, it really boils down to Connor Norby and Kobe Mayo. Norby was seemingly helped by the fact that Holiday was sent down to Norfolk because it does create an opening at second base. One thing to keep in mind with Norby is that his situation, I mentioned this on our episode last week, 
his situation is different than Joey Ortiz last year because Ortiz was already on the 40-man roster. So it was easy for the Orioles to call him up for those short stints. Whereas Norby, they're going to have to add to the 40-man roster. So they're going to look for a longer window where they can get Norby consistent at bats before they promote him to the major leagues. The same thing goes for Kobe Mayo because, again, he's not on the 40-man roster. You want him to come up at a point where he has consistent playing time. The fact that Holiday has been sent down and that Norby has more AAA experience than Mayo does could give him the advantage for now. But I could see either one of those guys coming up in the not-too-distant future. And we want to throw another name into this discussion. I would not be surprised if Wanda Sincharlis gets a look in the major leagues before too long. Charles has elite stuff, and he's flashed that at points this year for Norfolk. The walks so far have been a little high, but given where he was last year in his time at AAA, he's made significant improvements with his command. So if he can show over the next few weeks that he's able to locate his pitches consistently, I could see the Orioles giving him a shot in their bullpen, even if it's kind of a trial run while a pitcher or two is down with an injury or just needs a rest because he could be one of those guys with his stuff that at worst maybe emerges as a formidable mid-relief option. Maybe he gets to the point where you're putting him in high leverage spots, but making some improvements with the command, he's showing the elite pitches right now in particular with his fastball. So don't rule out Charles getting to the major leagues before too long. And while we're talking about prospect promotions, Billy B wants to know if I'm a fan of the call-up videos that the Orioles put out on social media. Uh, we've seen this before. You go back to when Adley Rutzman was promoted to the major leagues. There was a video posted uh, from a camera that was in Buck Britton's office, the manager of the Tides, giving Rutzman the news. Not to mention there's usually the hype video that goes with it. The answer to this question is yes, I do like the call-up videos. They're fun. It adds to the excitement of a player being promoted. And it's worth noting, too, as hard as it is for us to believe it, because Bob, Nick, and I are so consumed by it, and our listeners follow the minor leagues so closely. But there are you know, a fair number of Orioles fans who follow the major league team closely, but maybe don't pay attention to the minor leagues all that much or maybe only start to follow certain players when they get to AAA. So this is another way of signaling to those fans who aren't following the minor leagues as closely, this player is a big deal. He's part of our future. Used to get excited. Now come out to Cannon Yards and see him in action. And we'll go now to a question about the minor leagues from Bri Bri Superfly, who says, Delmarva's offense obviously hasn't gotten off to a strong start. Is there any position player there doing well or anyone who is performing better than what the stats suggest, either by eye test or underlying data? And then as a follow-up question to that, he wants to know, how do you evaluate concerns with guys at this level? And I'll take the last part of the question first, which is to kind of describe how I look at low-A hitters. And I think Bob and Nick have a similar mindset when looking at Del Marva, which is that you have to expect now that first-year players are going to struggle at low A more than what we were used to seeing in the past. And it reflects two things. One of them is the elimination of short season ball, of short season A, which was a good intermediate level for players to, who had mastered the Florida Complex League or the Gulf Coast League, as it was known back then, to face higher-level pitching before going into full season ball. And we've seen a lot of examples in the last few years, uh, whether it's been Anderson De Los Santos, Miss Ale De Son, Creed Willems, guys who could have used that first, that intermediate step in between the complex league and low A before going to low A. And I think it's been a tough adjustment for hitters and pitchers, but hitters in particular. So now you have to allow for the fact that hitters are going to struggle a little bit more. Another thing that we've seen play out in the last few years is the shift in how the Orioles develop hitters compared to the way things used to be done. 
I I go back to you know the early to mid 2010s. I was living in Hagerstown at that point, and Delmarva would come through there a lot. And their rosters early in the season were usually loaded with college hitters from the previous year's draft. So I remember seeing DJ Stewart come through as a Sorber, Trey Mancini, Tristan Walker, Mike Yastrzemski, among some other guys. So in the Duquette years, they would draft a college hitter. They might get to Delmarva by the end of their first season or the, their first summer out of the draft, but then they could start back there the following year and maybe be there for a couple of months before getting promoted to Frederick. And in some cases, you would see the player play at three levels and get to Bowie. What's happened under Michael Elias, though, is that the Orioles were moving their college hitters a little bit more aggressively. And while this has not been the case for everyone, a lot of college hitters now go to Delmarva out of the draft. And then before the summer is over, if they're really excelling, they get to Aberdeen for the final couple of weeks of the season and then start back there at the beginning of the following year. So your college hitters are now challenged on the front end a little bit more than they were in the Duquette years when they would go to Delmarva and kind of have that transition to pro ball where they're you know, able to dominate younger competition in some cases before making the jump up to high A. Now your hitters are going, your college hitters by and large are going right to high A, which means Delmarva's rosters are skewing a little bit younger, and that tends to lead to some struggles offensively. Now, shifting the focus to the current Sorbert team, and that's correct. They have not hit particularly well at this stage in the season. It's a big reason why they are struggling as a team, but there are some signs of hope, and I want to single out Thomas Sosa for a moment. Um, Sosa, as I'm recording this, which is on Sunday afternoon, hitting this 227 with a 677 OPS, but he has been picking up the pace over the last week or two, and for a, he's kind of bucking what we've seen the last few years where guys struggle in their first full year. Sosa right now, it's still early, but he looks like he might be the guy who has a rough couple of weeks early on and then settles in, settles in and is able to produce at a higher level. I also want to see what Jake Cunningham is able to do when he comes back from injury. He only appeared in two games before going on the IL. So that's someone that once he comes back, you could see some results that's played from him. And then Yudis Mordan um, has cooled off a little bit since his really hot start to the season, but there's a lot of things that he does really well. I'm looking in particular at his walks, 10 walks so far and 59 plate appearances. For a young hitter, he shows a lot of patience. He's got some power, and I think he's going to put together a nice season for the Sewerbirds. While we're on the topic of prospects, my co-host Bob Phelan jumped into the mailbag, and he wanted to know, what prospects are you considering adding to your personal top 50? Anybody that is close to falling off. Now, this is where I should mention that if you're a member of our Patreon community, you can look forward to our next monthly update of our top 50 prospects list sometime here in the next week or two. I don't have an exact date yet, but Bob, Nick, and I will be back on the air together on May 6th. And I would think the top 50 prospects list is going to be released around that time. Of the three of us, I'm probably the most conservative in terms of movement of prospects on my personal list, especially early on in the year, because I don't want to overreact to something good or bad in the first month of the season. So I tend to not move players around that much. With that said, I can tell you right now of a handful of guys that I know are going to be moving up on my list. Frederick Ben Cosme is one of them. I'm really buying into the changes he's made with his plate approach showing a little bit more power. His defense also looks like it has taken a step forward. So I expect that he is going to move up my list. Creed Willems is off to a nice start. He can move up a few spots on my list. And then as for who's going to come on the list, Edgar Portes fell just outside of my top 50 uh, that I did before the season. I will find room for him this time around. He's going to make the list. And Moises Chasse is going to go on my top 50 somewhere as well. I don't want to give away too much because I want our patrons to listen to this episode when it comes out and be surprised. But one thing I can say is that because Colton Kowser has graduated, that's going to open at least one spot on my list. And I 
have a pretty good idea of how the rest of the list is going to shake out. I haven't finalized it yet, but I would say right now that Chasse and Portez are going to be added onto the list with players like Ben Cosme making a little bit of a jump from where I had them the last time I updated the top 50. I'll wrap up with this question from Devin, who wants to know, when recording solo, do you ever get the urge to use a second silly voice to feel less lonely? I can't say that I've had that urge, but it reminds me of a uh, story from a few years ago that I thought our listeners might enjoy hearing. That we had only, Bob, Nick, and I had only been doing the show for about a year and a half at this point, and we had booked a guest to come on an episode, and we had written out our questions for this guest. We thought everything was good to go. We get on to record the episode, and the guest doesn't show up. And we didn't have a contingency plan for what we were going to do if this particular guest didn't show up when they were supposed to show up. And I'm not going to say who it was, although if you're a longtime listener of the show, you might remember this episode. But we didn't have a contingency plan for what are we going to talk about for an hour if this person doesn't show up. So we realized that the guest isn't going to be on. We still have to do the show. We've got to come up with something to talk about. And just out of desperation, I said to Bob, just answer the questions that are on the list as if you are the guest. We're going to introduce the guest, and we're just going to ask the questions that we've written out, except Bob is going to be the one that answers them. It wasn't so much that Bob was going to have to impersonate the guest, but we were just kind of desperate at that moment. We really needed something to do. Bob didn't take me up on that offer, which was probably a good thing because the guest ended up coming on later on. But that was one time where it's like, all right, well, maybe we do need an alternate voice here because we have a whole episode playing around a guest who is not here. As it was, we ended up improvising some topics and frankly, I think put together a pretty good episode. But the 20 minutes or so leading up to that, once we realized that person we had booked would not be joining us were uh, a little challenging to say the least. And with that, that does it for this episode of Orioles on the Verge. I will be back later this week with a preview of the 2024 MLB draft, a very, very early preview as the draft is not until July. Still, though, we have some mock drafts to look at, and we'll highlight some of the players that the Orioles could consider with their first pick, which will be the 22nd overall selection in July's draft. In the meantime, you can find us on our many social media channels. We are over at Facebook, Instagram. Threads, X, TikTok, and YouTube. Also, be sure to subscribe to our Substack. We are over at Orioles on the Verge.substack.com. And as one final reminder in this episode, we will be live at Checker Spot Brewing at 2 p.m. on Saturday, May 11th. You are not going to want to miss that. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to Orioles on the Verge, part of the Believe Podcast Network. Time for a meatful meditation by Smithfield. We know a thing or two about meat. Close your eyes and visualize yourself prepping your favorite meaty meal like sizzling bacon, a flavor-packed and pre-marinated pork loin, or a juicy cut of ham. Now step closer to those high-quality meats and take a deep breath in and out. Go ahead and take a bite. Oh, wait, you can't? Then it's time to stop the meditation and put the real quality meats from Smithfield on your plate. Smithfield, for the love of all meat. Wherever the road may take you, Discount Tire and Continental Tire get you there safely with the perfect combination of style, comfort, and price. Get a set of Continental Tires at your local Discount Tire store or online at DiscountTire.com. Discount Tire, let's get you taken care of. At Amica Insurance, we know it's more than a life policy. It's about the promise and the responsibility that comes with being a new parent. Being there day and night and building a plan for tomorrow, today. For the ones you'll always look out for, trust Amica Life Insurance. Amica. Empathy is our best policy. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. 
Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home.